Namaste and welcome to the Festival of Bharat. My name is Divyanshi Sharda, your host. Our very special guest for today's show is none other than Shri Vivek Debroy ji. Padma Shri awardee Shri Vivek Debroy ji is the chairman of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. Vivek ji has authored over 110 books in the field of economics, polity, indology and Sanskrit. He translated the unabridged version of the Mahabharat into 10 volumes amounting up to 2.5 million words into English becoming only the third person ever to achieve this feat. Sir has also translated the Bhagavad Gita, the Hari Vams, the Vedas, Valmiki's Ramayana, the Bhagavad Puranas and the Markandeya Purana. Along with Manmath Nath Dutt, he is only the second person to have translated both the Mahabharat and the Ramayana in the uh, in the unabridged form into English. He has featured in the 2019 Limca Book of World Records as the most prolific translator. Vivek ji, namaste and welcome to our show. Namaste and thank you for inviting me to your show. We are truly honored to have you here with us, sir. So uh, you have translated the unabridged version of the Mahabharat into English into 10 English volumes. Could you please tell us what your journey was like while translated while translating the Mahabharat into English? That's not a very easy question to answer. So uh, it is not as if all of this is in the past tense. This is ongoing work. you are absolutely right that i have translated the mahabharat the valmiki ramayan the hari vamsha the bhagavad gita is a different thing into english after that what i intend to do is to translate the puranas into english in unabridged form for the sake of the viewer and i'm saying this because people do not often realize this the puranas are huge we have a vague idea of what the puranas are by watching very simplified dumbed down versions on television or other forms the mahabharat and the valmiki ramayana usually are two texts that people are familiar with unlike that relatively speaking i don't think there is that much of awareness about the puranas this wasn't probably the case 100 years ago but certainly i feel that today particularly amongst the younger generation particularly amongst the generation that speaks english awareness of the puranas is not that much you mentioned that the 10 volume by the way the puranas are believed to have been composed by krishna the vaipayan veda vyasa after composing the mahabharata so they add to the mahabharata it's the same composer the same author there are 18 major puranas the mahabharata is believed to have 100000 shlokas and you mentioned that my translation into 10 volumes amounts to about 2.25 million words the 18 puranas the mahapuranas the major puranas collectively they amount to 400000 shlokas that will be about 12 million words as of now i have done and they have been published the bhagavat puran and the markandeya puran because of the pandemic publication schedules of publishers have been delayed i have finished the brahma puran and the vishnu puran which will be published soon i am now doing the shiva puran my intention is to translate if i live that long all the 18 mahapurana how has my journey been it's not a very easy question to answer because there are certain difficulties in translating these texts particularly into english there is a process of learning also that happens 
because you learn about our sanskriti you learn about our parampara you learn about our traditions you learn about our legacy you learn about our history you learn about our geography and not just the mahabharata and the valmiki ramayana but the puranas also because the puranas are like encyclopedia so today if we go and worship at a temple the temple construction is prescribed in several texts but the primary text or one of the texts that describes this is the matsya purana yes the way images of gods and goddesses are crafted that's agni purana the way we do our sadha ceremonies that is gadur purana so we are living the puranas without always realizing them there is another aspect which of course is if you are doing this you yourself tend to change but since i am the subject how i have changed it is not for something for me to describe you should ask my wife or someone like that to see how i have changed but obviously doing a translation work like this also changes you that's really fascinating sir to know how extensive and how impactful the sanskrit translation process is and the sheer effort that goes into such a magnificent line of work that is so effectively preserving our heritage so i would really on the behalf of the whole festival of bharat team just thank you once for doing so much for our culture and our country so uh, so we often hear that the british colonial sanskrit philologists were the first ones to mass translate our scriptures into english in your learned opinion do you think the translations were accurate um there is a certain class of sanskrit texts i'm interested in as i've just explained itihas and the purana what is often described as the pancham veda because they popularize what is there in the veda vedas and vedanta are things that probably interest only a very small percentage of population the bulk of the population consists of people who are not sanyasis they are greater what they do what they are supposed to do is on the basis of itihas purana one of the problems with western translation has been that by and large Itihas Purana has not been translated. By and large, there have been exceptions. There has been Parjitar, there has been Horace Wilson, but by and large, they have not been translated. They have been dismissed as myth. If you look at the sacred books of the East series, edited by Max Muller, it translated literature, Kalidasa. It translated Vedas. it translated upanishad your question was about the quality of the translation i am making a point that that is a secondary question the problem is that those were not even translated in general people ignored them dismiss them they are myths there is another series which most people are not aware of or have forgotten called not sacred books of the east sacred books of the hindus published towards the beginning of the 20th century by panini press in allahabad that at least started to translate a few of the purana now so far as the quality of the translation is concerned two points i want to make firstly it's not simply a question of someone being westerner in the sense of citizenship i can think of many indians who are indians in terms of their citizenship but in everything else they are much more westernized than perhaps many westerners 
issue is that all of these texts are issues are texts about dharma so unless you appreciate the nuances of dharma unless you treat these texts with respect then i don't think you will be able to accurately translate them and this i'm saying not purely from the point of view of westerner as defined in terms of citizen but to my mind that criticism is somewhat negative because it's all right so and so got it wrong so and so translated it wrong that is a negative criticism unless we collectively begin to do our own translation because that is the constructive part so yes i have problems with some of those translations when they have been done and translations need to keep happening all the time it is by no means the case that my translations are perfect someone else should come and translate them again and improve them certainly so certainly translation work and uh, the entire field of sanskrit philology and indology should be uh, made a very prime focus of history researchers and historians in india because this is the question of completely uh, re-exploring our own heritage uh, so as to rescue it from the clutches of anything of any uh, possible distortion that might affect it so sir uh, in what ways do you think that the academic study of indology can be decolonized how do we take this accurate knowledge of indology to the masses especially the upcoming generations um again this has many layers firstly and we are really talking about translations in english now many of these used to have translations in other languages non english languages but increasingly a point that i made earlier we are talking about a generation that is much more comfortable with english quite apart from the issue of international dissemination so i'm talking about english language translations firstly the translations need to be done the national manuscript mission has an estimate namami has an estimate that 95% of these manuscripts have not been translated so unless they are translated we will not know what is in them so if i say no knowledge existed in our tradition logically that's a fallacious proposition unless that has been translated and i am able to read the problem of course is and this exercise has to be multidisciplinary it is not just in the logic multidisciplinary the problem of course is people who know sanskrit do not seem to be interested or are not that comfortable in the english language and people who write the english language typically don't know the sanskrit so i think this is the problem that we need to bridge so that the learning of sanskrit and i'm saying sanskrit because the texts i am talking about are in sanskrit although there are many other texts that are in other languages also so this need to come together for the dissemination to happen now make no mistake these are very very long texts as i said and i do not think anyone unless the person is sufficiently motivated will read a mahabharata translation that extends for 10 volumes or a, a skanda puran translation which will have 15 volumes but at least that information is there in case someone is interested truly truly and so uh, like you said that uh, you have translated extensively numerous scriptures in sanskrit into english so while working on the dharmic scriptures 
what are some key aspects of the same which you found noteworthy and would like to share with us um i will repeat the point i said about uh, multidisciplinary and let me give one of my favorite examples which is from the markandeya purana in the markandeya purana there is a story there is a story about a demoness a demoness named jata harini jata harini as the name implies is a demoness who steals a newborn infant steals it from the house where that baby has been born transfers it to another house where another baby has been born exchanges the baby and keeps doing it and causes confusion fine but the markandeya purana also tells us that in the process this demoness devours eats the third baby now what this is telling us is whenever the markande puran was composed the infant mortality rate was 1/3 33 per thousand and until the 19th century the inter- infant mortality rate even in some developed countries used to be of that magnitude or certainly the end of the 18th century now this is the kind of thing that will not normally occur to a traditional indologist or sanskrit scholar it will only occur to someone who has a development perspective in mind or take another example i am talking about the story that all of us are familiar with which is the story of manu and vishnu's matsya avatar a mean avatar when manu goes to have a bath in a river sees a small fish brings it puts it in a pot and the fish becomes larger and larger and larger and larger and eventually saves manu from the deluge from the flood what kind of fish was he the puranas they were composed in different parts of the country as we have the text today puranas that are from the coastal part say that this fish was a safari which is a silvery white fish you find in the sea puranas which are primarily composed in the eastern parts of india say that this fish was a rahu a rahu fish now these are interesting sociological insights an economist to look at governance and rajadharma the duty of a king which is no very not very different from the duty of the government today and look at not just kautilya's arthashastra but look at all of these texts which also talk about governance and rajadharma so therefore one need to bring this multidisciplinary approach to looking at our itihas and purana very true sir this multidisciplinary approach should be a priority for all the sanskrit students and all the sanskrit translators who are working in this direction uh, if you were to summarize the very essence of sanatan dharm from the extensive scriptural study that you've done what would it be like did you say summarize in one sentence what one learns from these is that what you said <laughs> so not necessarily one sentence but in whichever way you would want to you would wish to i don't know if that question can at all be answered because the text i said they are texts about dharma they have a lot of history. the itihas is not myth itihas is itihi asa this is indeed what happened they have a lot of history they have a lot of information about how society developed its notions of dharma 
Dharma is something that holds up the fabric of society. Raja Dharma is one part of it. The other part of Dharma is what we do as householders. The other part of Dharma is what we do as communities. So it is about that. It is also about governance. It is also about the nature of change in the language because you can detect changes in the language. It is also about geological trans changes in India. Rivers drying up, civilizations moving towards the east. It is also about marrying the excavation with what the texts say to develop our sense of history. But all of these are fundamentally external. They are external to the individual. It is I as an individual in so far as the external society exists and my relationships with that external society. But these texts are also about dharma in the sense of internal realization and internal reflection about moksha dharma and therefore there is a learning that comes from these texts which is about that internal reflection when i tell people that are you aware that there are another at least 55 other gitas most people don't know because people think it is just the Bhagavad Gita. Gita is anything that was sung. And there are at least 55 other Gitas. There are around 20 Gitas in the Mahabharata. There are another 20 odd Gitas in the Puranas. And there are several other Gitas that hang loose. Now all of these Gitas are not about Sannyas and Moksha Dharma. For example, the Dharma Vyad Gita in the Mahabharata is essentially about the duties of a householder. So therefore, what you learn is partly a function of what you are looking for. It's partly a function of your receptivity. A message or the success of a message depends not just on the quality of the sender, it also depends on the quality of the receiver. So what you get from these texts really depends on you. Quite true, quite true. And finally, sir, my last question to you would be that do you think yes. there is a new idea of Bharat that is emerging? A new idea? Well, one sense of that is purely in the sense of governance, which is not what you're really asking, because I think there is a new questioning particularly amongst the young, about what India stands for as a polity. Not questioning socialism, secularism, or democracy, but asking about the forms that secularism, socialism, or democracy has taken. But that is a separate kind of thing. So far as these texts are concerned, I certainly detect a greater degree of interest in these. What I am not very clear about is perhaps that interest always existed, but earlier that interest did not manifest itself in the form of English. Today when we are saying this, when you are asking the question, we are talking about a generation that is more comfortable with English. We are talking about a generation that is on social media. Perhaps the earlier generation also had that interest, but that interest was in terms of leading, reading the Gita Press publications, in terms of reading Amar Chitra Katha, not so much uh, the net. So I am not very sure whether that interest has increased or whether it has changed form and expression. Earlier people would probably have read other authors in non-English languages. Today they develop their interest from reading Amish Tripathi or Ashwin Sangvi. But yes, I think certainly there is interest in the idea 
of i will not use the word india in this new bharat yes sir very true and i once again thank you sir for sharing your wonderful insights with us with the festival of bharat and i'm absolutely sure that our viewers would definitely delight from this wonderful conversation that we had and we truly honored to have you here with us thank, thank you for inviting me namaste namaste and pranam sir Namaste. We hope you enjoyed this Chitti Media content. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit cittti.net. Dhanyawad. Namaskar.